So welcome to the Contested Monuments webinar. This is the first webinar in the series on social justice and conservation. I'm Sarah Satrin, the Education Coordinator for the Foundation of Advancement in Conservation. I'm so glad to have you all here with us today. This program was organized by FAIC and volunteers from the AIC Equity and Inclusion Committee and the Emerging Conservation Professionals Network. I'm in Washington, DC, where the FAIC offices are located. I acknowledge that this is the traditional and ancestral land of the Piscataway and Anacostan peoples who have served as stewards of the region for generations. I'm going to give you a brief overview of the Zoom platform before turning it over to the moderators. You should be able to see the moderators and the panelists on your screen, as well as the title slide. To turn on the captions, find the closed captions button at the bottom of the screen and click the small arrow, then select show subtitles. We appreciate all of the questions submitted before the webinar and welcome additional questions throughout the session today. You can ask your questions by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and entering your questions there. Your questions will be sent directly to the moderators and they will address as many as possible. You can use the chat box to share comments and experiences throughout the session. Again, the webinar is being recorded and you will receive an email when the recording is available. I'll now turn it over to your moderators, Nyla Bird and Lelania Belanoweth. Lelania, you're on mute. <laughs> Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for this really important discussion. Uh, my name is Lalenia Volanoeth. I'm a textile conservator and I'm also the Los Angeles County Department of Arts and Culture Civic Art Conservation and Collections Manager. Um, here from central Los Angeles, uh, the LA County Departments of Arts and Culture recognizes and acknowledges the Yavatam the first peoples of this ancestral and unceded territory of Yanga that we now know as Central Los Angeles. We honor the Yavatam elders past and present and the Yavatam descendants who are part of the Gabrieleño, Tongva, and Fernandeño Tataviam nations. We honor and respect the many first peoples still connected to this land on which we gather and we commit our work and service to and in alignment with these values. My co-moderator is Nyla. Everyone, my name is Nyla Bird. I use she, her pronouns, and um, I am a second year in the Windsor University of Delaware program in art conservation. And I am currently on Lenape Hokink, which is the land of the Lenape people in Delaware. The land um, extends through most of Delaware and parts of what are now known as Pennsylvania and New Jersey. And I would just like to extend Wanishi, which means thank you in their language to them for stewarding the land, past, present, and into the future. Great, so we would like to introduce our panelists. Our first is Renee Ader who is a public scholar who works at the intersection of art and history. She is passionate about three-dimensional form, monuments, statues, and public space. She considers the relationship of the monument to the landscape and geography, its form and history, and how public ceremonies and civic events shape how we understand monuments and public spaces. Renee's work helps the audience under, uh, understand the meaning of monuments, how they shape over time, and new ways to gauge them, engage them in the present. And next, um, our next panelist is Brett Legs, who is an executive, who is the, the excuse me, executive director of the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund. Envisioned as a social movement for justice, equity, and reconciliation, the Action Fund promotes the role of cultural preservation in telling the nation's full history, while also empowering activists, entrepreneurs, artists, and civic leaders to advocate on behalf of African American historic places. Brent is a national leader in the U.S. preservation movement and recipient of the 2018 Robert G. Stanton National Preservation Award. 
His passion for elevating the significance of Black culture in American history is visible through his work, which elevates the remarkable stories and places that evoke centuries of Black activism, achievement, and community. We also welcome Ada Pinkston, an artist, educator, and cultural organizer living and working in Baltimore, Maryland, where she is a lecturer in art education at Towson University. Her work explores the intersection of imagined histories and sociopolitical real realities on our bodies using performance, digital media, and mixed media sculptures and installations. Nyla, would you like to give a word about this current session and what we're going to be discussing? Yeah, so the controversy surrounding Confederate statues and other contested monuments that celebrate slave owners, imperialism, and white settler colonialism have been highlighted in recent months. Although activists have advocated for the removal of these monuments for years, the racial unrest this summer has brought these issues to the forefront of the cultural heritage sector and greater society as community activists empower themselves to take down such monuments all over the world. This has caused conflicted feelings in some conservators who want to support racial justice in public spaces, but who have been traditionally taught to always prioritize the preservation of outdoor sculpture and monuments. Conservators may also be conflicted if their employers task them with care of contested monuments, calling professional ethics into question. At the crux of the matter are questions surrounding who is valued in our society and who gets to make decisions in regard to, in regard to public space and the interpretation of history. Competing values surrounding the removal of contested monuments will be explored with panelists introducing artists, historians, and preservation professionals, as we just introduced. So I am going to stop sharing my screen and we will start with Renee and let her begin her introduction. You're on mute. Hey. Right <laughs> you need to unmute yourself. Important thing would be for you, me to unmute so you can actually hear me. So thank you very much for the invitation to uh, talk today and to be in conversation. My name is Renee Ader and as uh, and I'm a, I'm a scholar who was trained as an art historian but really works now as a public historian. Um, my work, the current project that I work on is called Contemporary Monuments to the Slave Past, which I've pulled up here here for you to look at the website. Um, it is an Omeka site, which is an open source publishing platform that I use uh, mainly as a collections kind of management uh, database. I have thought of this. I have 170 monuments documented uh, in this site so far. Um, we also not only do we have objects, items, um, and collections of objects, a lot of Frederick Douglass statues out there. I'm also writing ex some exhibits uh, related to the objects that are in the database. Um, the goal of the project was originally uh, to, in some ways, to create an archive of these monuments because people kept telling me they didn't exist. Um, and I found myself, unfortunately, a little sad that Save Outdoor Sculpture, uh, I hope that you can see this page as well, the Save Outdoor Sculpture, um, that the Save Outdoor Sculpture program, which ran for about five years, no longer existed. So many of the monuments that I work on are not in that database. And so it seems smart to me to try to gather them together uh, at the core of this project. Um, I look at issues of memorialization, but also civic engagement, um, really at the core of my project uh, as it exists in this iteration in Omeka, is to really uh, think about civic engagement engagement and community involvement and discussions around monuments and what they want, what they want to come down, uh, what they want, uh, to, quite frankly, to be preserved, what kind of stories they want to tell. Um, so that's um, the kind of the initial uh, project uh, that I work on. It also, I'm, I'm trying to develop it into a um, and this is actually changing a little bit, but I have also taken all of my data out of the Omeka database. And quite frankly, I'm telling a story on Scalar, which is another open source publishing platform that is more geared towards telling a traditional story around objects that allows me to sequence objects in the text. So this is another kind of form and works in concert with the Omeka site. So Scalar is running out of USC. 
Um, and then there's kind of a third, there's, so there's these components that I realize that I've been working on um, that now I see as, a, as, as really being a components that are part of a larger whole. And I will um, point that out. Um, I run a blog and I should point out, I'm one of these people who has in fact advocated for the removal of a very particular monument in my town, um, which is, and, and I have had lots of debates with people about this, but it is the Thomas Ball um, Emancipation Group, which is in Lincoln Park here in Washington, DC and uh, lines up directly along East Capitol Street with the US Capitol building. And in fact, if you drew a line, you could draw a line from this monument to the Lincoln Memorial. Um, this monument is highly contested in Washington. Eleanor Holmes Norton, our delegate, has called for its removal. And I'm in agreement with her, and I've written a whole blog post about why I'm in agreement about the removal of this particular monument. Um, I think it's uh, uh, what I will quite frankly call racist overtones are hard to miss with the crouching uh, image of the enslaved person who has broken his shackle, but that kind of contrast that between the clothed and unclothed body, between black uh, unclothed body and white clothed body is a serious issue. Um, and it'll be interesting to see in Washington if this monument indeed comes down. But in general, um, I um, blog a lot about the monuments that I'm encountering, as well as the conditions that I'm finding them in. Um, so last year, I took a drive along the New York State Network of Freedom to document monuments along that to Harriet Tubman and to emancipation. Um, and lastly, I run a bit of a different uh, project that is actually tied into this as well, and it's uh, on Instagram. I started a digital Instagram memorial on June 1st of this year uh, in honor of uh, Mr. George Floyd. And I started, um, it's called I Can't Breathe, the Digital Memorial. And I create um, each uh, day a black and white memorial slide that goes on uh, to Instagram as a memorial site. And so I have been doing this for uh, since June and we continue to add names. So the project is not over yet. Um, and I see all of these pro projects as deeply um, tied together. So if I have just one more minute, can you see that screen now? It right. froze. It did it freeze again? Okay, give me one second. I will uh, close out all this other stuff, I think. Um, I wanted to um, show you one other, I'm just gonna close this all because this was causing problems. Um, is that better or no? Nope, it stopped. Okay, so can I go back now? Yep, go back. Sure. Let me share it again, yeah. Yeah, I think that doesn't like to switch from PowerPoint to... Um... So the way in which these projects are all going to come together is that Omeka will stay as a standalone database. We're about to crowdsource it at the beginning of November. And so we're putting out a community call to populate it with more monuments. And then my digital project will take this new kind of lean in towards um, a title that we've just tentatively come up with uh, called Meditations on Slavery, Mourning and Memorialization. I will look at really death and mourning and tie it historically to some of the monuments I'm looking at, but very much uh, tie it back to uh, the death of brown and black people by the police. And so that has become a core part of my project as well. And lastly, I should just point out, I've done quite a bit of work um, on these other kinds of sites. So I point to, for example, the Tuskegee Airmen National Historic Site. And I was really struck by Brent Legs' uh, uh, writing that preservation helps to contribute much to a forgetful society. So what does it mean to have restored Moton Field uh, for the Tuskegee, where the Tuskegee Airmen trained and flew out of? And what does that history look like? What kind of objects are collected uh, in this space? So I, my monument project's rather broad in what I consider. And lastly, I wanna to point to a problem that I face almost every time I go into monumental space. And that is, uh, we spend a lot of money on developing monuments. Uh, we spend very little uh, in conserving of them uh, over time. And this has me actually quite alarmed. This is the Contrabands and Freedmen Cemetery Memorial. And here's some photographs I took in 2017. 
and I want to show you how clear and legible it is uh, in 2017. And now something else is happening to the surface of the memorial. And so the names themselves, the text is starting to vanish. And what does that mean? I assume some kind of, uh, we can talk about this, chemical reaction is occurring. I also, and unfortunately I picked two cemetery memorials, but last year I was at the Historic Vale Cemetery and really shocked at the desecration that I encountered within the cemetery where someone had knocked over the headstones, uh, many of them within the black section of the cemetery. So these concerns around preservation, around the stories that we tell are really important to me. They're rooted in my project. And I have grown increasingly interested in our problem of black cemeteries related to both enslaved persons, but um, also free cemeteries uh, that began, you know, most of them in the 1850s, which are under extreme uh, stress and duress right now. So thank you, and I'll turn it over to the next person. So Brent, are you ready? I am. I am going to share my screen. Hello, everybody. I'm delighted to be here with you today. And Sarah, thank you for or excuse me, Renee, thank you for that fantastic intro presentation. I want to start out, oddly enough, with a quote by the cultural icon Beyonce. And these words were communicated during when she was created her visual album Lemonade, and it really resonated with me. The past and the future merge to meet us here. Keep this in mind as I walk through my talk. The Black experience, we have been fighting legacies of slavery for more than four centuries. These legacies are present in our everyday reality and are reflected in our historic built environment and across our cultural landscapes. The preservation movement was founded by the Mount Vernon Ladies Association. Their successful advocacy would preserve the home of, of President George Washington, a place called Mount Vernon, which you see here on the screen. That birth of a, of a movement over time has created cultural inequities in the erasure and omission of African-American historic places from our historical record. We all know that the African-American community has been fighting against urban renewal. This is a historic black neighborhood in Charlotte, North Carolina called Brooklyn, decimated by urban renewal you can look at most major and mid-market cities and literally there's a story of historic erasure. You know, I think of the Deep Deuce neighborhood in Oklahoma City. You can think of, of the West End neighborhood in, in Louisville, Kentucky, or even think about the U Street Corridor in Washington, D.C. We continue to fight against redlining and disinvestment. Do you ever ask yourself why it's hard to go to any major city and find a thriving and vibrant black commercial district where historic buildings are, are occupied and thriving? This is too often the condition within black historic neighborhoods. We continue to fight against racial terrorism. We all remember what happened in 2015 when a white nationalist would walk inside of this historic sacred church, Mother Emanuel in Charleston, South Carolina. We ended up giving our largest grant last year of $150,000 to the church to help them to restore their historic sanctuary. But this is a story that is often too familiar. We continue to fight against disrespect, whether it is these horrible words 
spray painted on the second oldest standing black church building in the United States. It's called the African Meeting House in Nantucket, Massachusetts. And we are fighting to bring these vandals to justice. So whether it is someone typing on their keyboard during a conversation like today, or if someone is expressing their cultural values on a historic site, this is who America is. And this last photo really is the essence of the work of the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund. It is to answer this question. This was during the Black Lives Matter protest movement here in Washington, DC. An unnamed protester would spray paint these words on the side of the historic Decatur House in the shadows of the White House, a historic space where enslaved Americans were held in bondage. This building is a National Trust historic site and operated by the White House Historical Association. And the question is, why do we have to keep telling you Black Lives Matter? The Action Fund was born in the aftermath of Charlottesville in 2017. We remember this image where white nationalists rallied around a Thomas Jefferson sculpture on the campus of the University of Virginia. It didn't express our national values and it was the first time that historic preservation was part of a national discourse. We brought together some national leaders and the result was how can we use cultural preservation heritage and identity to begin the process of reconstructing American history and our understanding of ourselves. But how can we also begin to confront the miseducation of Americans? So the Action Fund was born, $25 million campaign, largest ever undertaken on behalf of African historic places. And this is part of our mission. In essence, the Action Fund is a movement to redefine a new American culture and narrative. We are working to build a true national identity that reflects our full diversity to create a more just and equitable society. We believe that preservation is a force for positive social change. The way that we do this is in partnership. We believe that new forms of partnership, interpretation, and community is the future for preservation. We've got to build new audiences and bring new thought leaders into the movement. Here are the 20 social justice leaders that are part of the board of the Action Fund, which is co-chaired by Darren Walker, who's the president of the Ford Foundation, and actor and director, Felicia Rashad. So I just wanna highlight a few of our, our projects and our programmatic work and to demonstrate that preservation is a tool for equity. I've been working at James Madison's Montpelier. It is the home of the father of the constitution. Over the last 20 years, this organization has been slowly building inroads with the descendant community of the formerly enslaved Americans here at this historic site. Created a permanent exhibit called the Mere Distinction of Color, which is fabulous if you have not seen it. But I think the most important work is developing shared governance and authority model where the newly established descendant community and nonprofit is exploring how they can share authority and interpretation and site management. We hope this becomes a national model for the field. The National Grant Program of the Action Fund is the signature piece of our work. I just wanted to highlight these numbers. So over three grant rounds, we have received almost 2,000 proposals requesting almost $200 million. This is a drop in the bucket of what the full need is but it really speaks to the fact that African American historic places continue to be underfunded and undervalued. I'm glad to say that we have invested in 65 preservation projects across the United States, 
with the goal of creating new models for preservation and raising awareness of this cultural significance and the importance of these cultural assets. Places like Claiborne Temple in Memphis, Tennessee, where the civil rights movement became more sophisticated and it moved beyond political activism and began to advocate for economic justice. Inside of the basement is where the I Am A Man posters were, were pressed and created. We provided a $100,000 grant for them to hire their first preservation manager. Shaco Bottom, second largest slaveholding site in the United States. If you visit it today, it is nothing more than concrete and parking lots. And what seems to be invisible is still rooted within the black community in Richmond. It is part of their collective memory. So we wanted to empower the community and give them the tools to be able to advocate for a memorial park. And this is what their vision is. And I'm glad to say that Mayor LaBar Stoney supports the creation of the Memorial Park. It is now part of the city's land use plan. And I had the good fortune of moderating a conversation with him Wednesday, five o'clock at our national conference. And we're talking about memorialization, Confederate monuments and African-American heritage. I'm sure some of you have heard of the legendary jazz musician, Nina Simone, known as the voice of the American Civil Rights Movement. What's inspiring about this project is four New York City-based visual artists as a form of arts activism and politics would save the house from demolition, create an LLC, buy it. We establish a partnership with them and other organizations and I hope that this inspires other artists to follow in the footsteps to actually own, steward, and uplift places that at first glance seem standing without historical meaning and value. But this vernacular architecture is reflective of the Black experience and they're worthy of being preserved. So if you haven't seen it, we just released on the 15th of this month, our new equity report, and it is highlighting 10 historically African-American neighborhoods from LA to Harlem and New York, Louisville, Kentucky, and beyond. And we're understanding the role of preservation and how it's contributed to issues of affordability, displacement, and gentrification. And you see these stats on the on the right side, it really speaks to the fact that African American historic places have faced increased disinvestment, demolition, and negative impacts in our historic African American neighborhoods. We're also working to create space for graduate students and professionals to help amplify the stories and the culture behind these places like a freelance journalist, Brianna Rhodes, who's writing about our grantees, to Yoruba Richin, who's pr producing a short doc on preserving John and Alice Coltrane's house in New York. I think this is my last slide. I wanted to highlight that we are committed to introducing diverse youth between the ages of 16 to 25, introducing them to preservation trades, and using this as an opportunity to grow the preservation economy and create job opportunities for individuals that look like this. And they had the good fortune to help stabilize the building and paint the exterior of Nina Simone's home. So leaving you with this, the past and the present merge to meet us here. Hopefully this conversation and the resulting discussions afterwards that we can put together a national agenda that confronts anti-Blackness and the discrimination against communities of color and that we can build a more impactful contemporary preservation movement. Thank you. Thank you, Brent. Now we're, Ada, are you ready? 
Yeah, I am. So basically, I'm not going to only talk about my work. I'm going to talk a little bit about the ethos behind my work. Um, and then we'll have a conversation about it all together. All right. Um, so I am a mixed media artist that makes work to wake us up and um, face to face our time. Um, I am interested in how to recognize the imaginary of whiteness and the invisibility of intersectional oppression and the visibility of constructs of power and race and the material realities of class. And through my work, I'm interested in rewriting canonical accounts of history through collaborative works, digital media, and immersive installations. Um, this image here is an example of a piece that was done in 2016 after the death of Freddie Gray in Baltimore, Maryland. And it was a, a temporary monument for people that are victims and survivors of various acts of state sanctioned violence. Um, but in this talk, we're gonna, I just wanna go a little bit about, go through um, how monuments create our contemporary landscape. And I also want to talk a little bit about how artists are an, are an important element in this research and in this conversation. And um, for me, my primary resources are basically what we see in online, what's in the library archive, what type of conversations I have with people in the world, right? So I, I'm a teacher, so I'm very much thinking about pedagogy all the time with my praxis. Um, so when you do a Google image search, the, these are the images that come up when you look up public space. When you do a Google image search, these are the images that come up when you look up the term monument. Um, so we have stone, bronze, plaster, marble, cement, steel. Monuments are places and spaces that carry significant weight to the social architecture of a place. They are oftentimes large and foreboding, overlooking the spectator with eyes of reverence. And the spectator is overcome, completely surrounded and encapsulated by the form that is the monument. And that is only if people stop to look. But what is the definition of this word? Um, according to Merriam-Webster, it is obsolete. It is a burial vault. It is a written legal document or record. It is a treatise. It is a lasting evidence. It is a reminder or so of something or someone notable or great. It is a distinguished person. It is a memorial stone or building erected in remembrance of a person or event. It is archaic. It is um, an effigy. It is a position, a marker. Um, but as we can see from the shifting nature of this word monument, the monument as an object um, basically changes over time, right? And it changes according to the social and economic and political perspectives and circumstances of the time. Um, some monuments have been stolen or acquired through questionable means and other monuments maintain their reference and scale in the public sphere despite the fact that they are subjects of acrimonious debate. Um, so you know this this subject of, of the shifting understanding of monuments is a, is a global um, conversation that we've seen uh, specifically, you know, in the wake of all of the, the protests that happened in June, July, um, this movement, this Black Lives Matter movement is a global movement, right? And I, I wanted to, to point that out because I think it's, it's important to think about um, what does it mean to create spaces, public space that is anti-colonial um, but to bring it back to the US, according to the Southern Poverty Law Center, there are more than 1,700 symbols of the Confederacy in public spaces and 113 Confederate symbols have been removed 
since the Charleston massacre in 2015, including 49 monuments, four flags, and name changes for 36 schools, seven parks, three buildings, and nine roads. Um, most Confederate monuments were built in the 20th century. And I know that we are in a virtual room filled with scholars and people that are interested in, in the past. So I'm sure that you're aware of the different, the time frame that most of these monuments were built. Um, but because of this, I, I just wanted to highlight um, that some people also believe that the removal of these symbols is a tragedy as they are not symbols of white supremacy and power, but symbols of the history of the United States, right? But what is it that makes certain people think that this lost cause and narrative associated with Stonewall Jackson, Andrew Johnson and Robert E. Lee to be true? Um, because it has been documented that these historical figures themselves rejected the need to hold on to, to division. Um, one of the most unfortunate and widely accepted ideas about historical thinking is that history is written by the victors. This talking point asserts that the truth of the past is not shaped by reason interpretive historical scholarship or a factual understanding of the past, but by the might of political and cultural leaders on the winning side of history, the winners have the power to take to shape historical narratives through school textbooks, public iconography, movies, and a range of other mediums. Confederate monuments were resurrected years after the Civil War. I just want to highlight that for everyone in the room. And um, Confederate monuments were so, and if this, if this history is in the victor's perspective, um, then the production and creation of the narrative of the last cause of slavery makes no logical sense because the Confederate powers lost. But what were and are the social conditions that make these social norms so incredibly stuck? Why do some people feel so inclined to hold on to the idea of Confederate memories and Confederate legacies in public space? Um, so we see this quote by Robert E. Lee. Um, he wanted to have nothing to do with the Confederate flag after his death. And neither did Jefferson Davis. Um, so what are the social conditions that make the Confederate daughters do so much towards fundraising to produce these sculptures and develop the framework for stories about Confederate, uh, this Confederate public memory. So for this, I'm gonna talk, I'll just go a little bit through um, some philosophical theories about truth, right? And what the aesthetics of truth are. Um, so Ayer had this, had some very interesting perspectives about um, truth. So he was basically like, you can't, the only thing that's true is, is math. That's the only thing that you can argue is math and science. And, um, but then like right before he died, he was like, this doesn't make sense. This is the dumbest book I ever wrote. I don't know why I wrote this. So I'm gonna move on to the next book. So then Foucault was all about um, talking about power and power as, it's re as it relates to truth. And so he says that power is everywhere and comes from everywhere. So in this sense, power is neither an agency nor a structure and truth is a thing of this world. It is produced only by virtue of multiple forms of constraint and induces um, regular effects of power. So these general politics are so it's like they're regimes of truth and they're the result of scientific, scientific discourses, institutions, uh, they are reinforced and redefined constantly through the education system, again, through media, um, through the flux of politics and economic ideologies. And in the case of historical truth, for instance, this becomes really important to consider because, for instance, in the state of Texas, um, K through 12 social studies curricula excluded recognizing um, the transatlantic slave trade and instead called um, this is in elementary school textbooks in 2015, there they called um, people that were enslaved indentured servants, right? So this, so I, I say that to say it's important to think about 
um, the public space, but it's also important to think about the pedagogy, right? And how do we how do we think about cultural memory in a holistic way? Um, but I have I have two more minutes. I know I'm going a little bit over, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about Stuart Hall and what he said. He's another really amazing philosopher that talks about truth and historical truth, and he says. Um, Stuart Hall, I'm sorry, race is a floating signifier, okay? So, and he says this, and I'm going to put this in quotes, what do I mean by a floating signifier? Well, to put it crudely, race is one of those major concepts which organize the great classif classificatory systems of difference which operate in human society. And to say that race is a discursive category recognizes that all attempts to ground this concept scientifically to locate differences between the races on what one might call scientific, biological, or gener genetic grounds have been largely shown to be untainable. So in addition to historical objects, these Confederate monuments truly are signifiers. They're signifiers in the most literal sense of the word. Um, they're signifiers of white supremacy and tragic moments of, of injustice and oppression. So now, how do we face our time? And if truth is constructed by people in power to maintain power, then we have to be careful and vigilant. Because as Kevin Young wrote in his book, Bunk, The Rise of Hoaxes, Plagiarists, Phonies, and Fake News, there's oftentimes a conflation between feeling as fact, feeling over fact, and when it comes to our understanding of the truth in the 21st century, we really need to consider what is fact and what is a feeling. So again, I just went over all of that to just talk about the ethos behind my work. Um, I really see myself as a part of a movement, a contemporary movement of artists and activists, and we're creating counter narratives, um, reconsidering colonial, this colonial past and developing new aesthetics of the form of our understanding of history and public space and public memory. And this artistic movement is about obfuscating. How do we obfuscate hegemony um, through reconsidering materials? And um, what does it mean? And reconsidering like the, the pedagogy or the conversations that are around the objects of, of the stories of the past. So how do we think about moving past this white male centered account of history throughout public space in the United States? Um, but you can see my work uh, on landmarkedproject.com and then my Instagram, Instagram is here and then this is my personal website. So the long, one of the long-term goals is to create a, uh, a basically like a 3D printed material that changes form every two years. Um, but, and it's, it, there's, so it creates more of a dialogue instead of a static form but this work, I started it in 2016 and it started off with a series of conversations and workshops and then that's how this future, future plan came to be. But um, with that, I'll stop sharing and we'll have this conversation. <laughs> Thank you all so much for sharing, you know, your work and your introductory thoughts with us. That was great. Um, sort of branching off of some of the things that Ada just mentioned, we got a question submitted to us that says, and I think it sort of segues nicely, and it asks, what are your thoughts on the phrase, um, re like, removing these monuments erases history? Um. I don't, I don't think it erases history. So I, so I, um, and if you looked in some of the images that I showed, right, like there's, there's other examples of monuments that have been removed in other contexts, right? So in Germany, right, when um, Hitler was in power, there are all of these, these fascist monuments that were installed throughout the country. And in Russia as well, there are a lot of, of monuments for um, authoritarian figures, but those monuments were removed and placed in a museum 
or they were placed in a in a, a grave site, right? So it's like the monuments are removed and put somewhere where more uh, context can be given around um, the story of how they came to be, right? But also most of those monuments weren't really built at the time that, uh, you know what I mean? Most of those monuments were built at the height of Jim Crow as a way to maintain white supremacist ideology, right? So their objects aren't, objects aren't really related to history. The objects are related to uh, the construction of whiteness. Um, but I'll let somebody else talk about that. I would argue that monuments are not history. And this is why we people seem to be very confused in the public is they somehow think that a monument is history and it is not. Um, history is a sequence of events. It's something that hopefully we retrieve through a, a very complicated archive that shows us multiple voices. But I think for me, oftentimes the monuments that we're talking about that Ada was referencing uh, in her talk, they really are about power and they're about the state, right? About state authority oftentimes, they're about power, they're about uh, the victor. And that's a very, th that's not history. That just happens to be the person who somehow ended up on top and wanting to tell their story uh, through the public, uh, through the public space. So I have, and I also think that monuments, I mean, I was really interested, Ada, and then I'll go let Brent talk, but Ada, I was really interested that you use this word pedagogy. Um, because I do think monuments are a form of pedagogy. And that's a very interesting idea that they have the capacity um, to tell us something um, about the past or to tell us something about an event or an individual. But they have this incredible power to convey, as you point out, white supremacy, right? To convey notions of racism, um, to convey, um, you know, profound disregard for women, even, right? A a within a public space. So, um, but I think, you know, this notion of um, their monuments being tied to the nation and to the state are really important for us not to lose that, to lose mind of that. And I would say as a preservation practitioner, I've asked myself many times over the last couple of years, what should we do? And should we support the erasure and, and destruction of of these monuments that I think I'm, I'm presently, I've landed on this idea almost of a cemetery, but not in a cemetery in sense, but removing these monuments from public space because they are communicating uh, an equitable and an accurate civic identity. And partly what I want our nation to do is begin to ask ourselves what monuments, new monuments, deserve the prominence of those civic spaces? And how can we fill gaps in our traditional American narrative? How can we tell stories related to, to Black women and their contributions in American history and, and continue that work of reconstructing our national identity, identity? And I'm hopeful if we can create a national plan where African Americans are leading with many others, but are leading the discussion about the future of these monuments. And I envision this landscape of justice where they would be relocated, where artists would reimagine these monuments the way that activists are currently doing in Richmond right now. That reimagining of cultural heritage and the reclamation of a cultural landscape. So seeing this landscape of justice where they are positioned with their back to our nation, that we never invest in their maintenance and future preservation. And if they then become organic moments that are decaying over time, that allows us to then measure our social progress. Because I think the work of, of becoming equitable and inclusive and confronting centuries of, of racism in the form of, of art and monuments, that lie needs to stand to ensure that we never forget. And again, if as you described, Ada, having the right kind of information that is accurate and thoughtful 
that stimulates a conversation, then maybe this landscape is a space of reconciliation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You all address like about 12 of our questions <laughs> to move next, um, but I'm gonna go in order. Um, is there an ap different approaches for removal or preservation for different historical figures as you know, mainstream populations are a bit behind uh, social activism and, and misinformation about um, statuary or the people who are represented in the statuary is is all kind of very all over the place. So like how would you approach someone like Jeff the removal of Jefferson Davis versus someone like George Washington? I think this is an excellent question, right? Or like the removal of Christopher Columbus even, yeah. right? I think that providing context is important. And I think it's, so for instance, when I, when I think about providing context or even like a counter narrative or like a, a, cause this is the thing, right? Like our architecture in general, like when you walk through public space, like most architectural forms are very there's it's it's reinforcing these power structures right like it's there most architectures are are male most architects are white right so it's like it's reinforcing that already off top but then i think thinking through what does it look like to recalibrate around a non-white male centered um, public space is important. And that look, I mean, the Brent, the, um, the illustration that I saw of, of that, that site in Richmond is beautiful because it's really thinking about like the natural landscape in ways that a lot of sites I think don't really do a good job with. And so I'm also in terms of like, I also like to think about monuments that are, that do a pretty good job, like Maya Lin's Vietnam Memorial is uh, is an example of an aesthetic that isn't recon like that isn't another white man on a horse or another white man on a pedestal, right? And it actually is a more of a democratically designed form, right? Where we have all of the names of the people who died during Vietnam War on that on that slab, right? But you know, when it was being installed, there was all of this debate and all of this uh, controversy around around it because it wasn't a person on a horse or it wasn't like this bronze figure that um, people tend to gravitate to when we think about monuments. But I say that to say the counter response to that was, um, I think that there was another, there were there's someone that made this design of like five uh, soldiers in a battlefield, like right next to it. So I think that thinking about like, what would the, the counter narrative be to George Washington, right? Like, what would that look like? What would that conversation be? I think that's important. And I would actually argue that part of that message happens, and I think Brent talked about this briefly, but it happens at these, uh, pr particularly if we're talking about presidents, it happens at their historic homes. And so I think the work that can, that's happening at Mount Vernon, and I still think they have more work to do there, but I think they've done some good interpretation of their slave past there. Um, what actually they've done at Montpelier, I've written about this, is kind of astounding to make alliances with the communities that are, are descendants who, who were enslaved on that property, it's pretty phenomenal to go there and experience um, descendants talking about what that slave past means to them in the context of Montpelier and James Madison's house. And I can tell you that's not happening everywhere. I went to James Madison's house uh, last summer and it's a disaster. Like they, the omission and willingness to ignore slavery is profound at some of these sites. 
Um, and so that becomes very important. I'm of a, of a per, I'm of the mind that I think every Confederate monument needs to be taken down yesterday. And I've been saying this for about a decade. Um, and I'm amazed that we're finally having the conversation, but I have really been arguing for the removal for a very long time. And I don't think that a lot of resources should be spent on their preservation. And this is a really key issue for me. When I encounter monuments right now around African-American history that are falling apart within five years of being built, I would like resources directed there. These Confederate monuments, uh, Ada, I've actually thought like, send them open a huge one of these Russian style parks in Texas. There's lots of lands to come out there. If people wanna go visit, go visit and be done with it like literally be done with this conversation around Confederate monuments, because we are actually spending an enormous amount of human capital talking about this problem when we know what the solution is in my mind. Like this is not a complicated problem. For some people it is clearly because it feels like um, this whole conversation of white heritage comes up. But it's a more profound issue. And I was just came across a book where this, this writer was comparing, of course, to Nazi Germany. Well, we don't have memorials to the Nazis. Like this, what, since when do the vanquished get to claim public space and re-narrate the, the story of the war into the lost cause? So um, I think the removal is really profound. I can see where that can make conservators very, very nervous. Um, and maybe someone gets to go work for that park and conserve those statues. But I think they need to be out of view. I think we need to move forward in thinking about what space should look like and what memorialization and monument building can look like. Um, I've been arguing a little bit for a pause because it feels like we're rushing super, super fast to populate our space. And I'm like, well, maybe we should actually pause and figure out what that what the memorial or monumental landscape is going to look like. Or do we even want to go with monuments? Um, you know, because I'm really interested in historic houses and historic sites and as, as putting a lot of preservation effort there. So, um, yeah. Well, I, I just want to second what Renee said. And I think that we are spending a lot of intellectual and social capital and that sometimes the Confederate monuments conversation is a distraction from, from mm -hmm. where our nation needs to direct its significant investment. And that is in the preservation of African American cultural assets, the places where real history happened, the places that speaks to black activism and free freedom, places that literally has moved our social consciousness as a nation forward. And, and what I'm passionate about is elevating the importance of these places and ensuring that they have the resources to be vibrant and open to the public and the right kind of operational and sustainability structures in place so that they can serve our nation to be able to confront, again, using this, this word, the miseducation, the undervaluing of Black contributions. And I think if, if these places stand across the American landscape and that all American children and citizens begin to see themselves in this history. That's the power that we seek collectively as a nation. I'm loving the direction this conversation has gone. Um, I'm going to navigate from, to one of the questions from our audience because I do think it curtailed nicely. So, um, they submitted this anonymously, but it says, when we talk about removing Confederate and racist statues to museums or other sites where they can be displayed in context, do any of you see any issue with the cost of maintaining these sites? Even if the sculptures are left to decay, as Brent Legs just described, there's still cost to making the sites safe, accessible, staffing, rent, property tax, et cetera. Could those resources be spent preserving other historical sites instead? Is there a way to make sure no further resources are put to these statues? Well, I would just say that the, the person is correct. There would need to be some resources for security. There would need to be thoughtful interpretation and accurate information to tell the truth about the meaning of, of these places. But I also think that there could be a lot of just goodwill and service directed to both the management and the reimagining of this. And, and I just go back to what I currently see in Richmond. I mean, we all have seen that lone statue 
literally cloaked in graffiti and paint almost seem as if the form is changing. There is something changing and the new sense of community that has been created. I mean, to have a, a food, a vegetable garden on that landscape, a makeshift basketball court, to see artists performing, uh, a marching band from an HBCU. This has just blown my mind for what this kind of landscape of justice could look like just on a bigger scale. And I think someone like the Equal Justice Initiative, given what they created in Montgomery, would be an excellent partner and, and manager of something like this. Can I just say the Mass Design Group is a really gr interesting group of you know folks who designed the memorial in uh, Montgomery, and I think they're visionary, like how they really resolved to have a memorial to a really heinous moment, and how powerful it is. The only memorial I've ever been to where I've sobbed, and I think that is really effective. That we have to work really hard at that monument, right? To process mm -hmm. that history of extra legal violence of lynching in the United States. And what does that mean for us right now? What are the ties to mass incarceration? For example, that they want you to draw in that space. Um, but yeah, those are, um, you know, this idea, you know, there's so a student of mine's working, I'm teaching a class on monuments. So a student of mine's down in Florida in Jacksonville and someone's bought two of these Confederate monuments to put on their fish camp. And a fish camp is a very particular Florida phenomena from what I can gather, having spent a lot of time down there, uh, where people really go out to like the Everglades to go fishing at these camps that are very basic. So they're, they're carting statues out to these odd locations, right? Uh, which points to, you know, what happens when all of that dissolves into the swamp or, you know, like the very real issue of climate change in relationship to these as to some of these monuments as well. Yeah, also I was gonna say in terms of, thinking through the resources. The reason why I started this project on monuments was literally because I saw the contrast between how the neighborhood that my grandmother lived in was being preserved versus the Confederate monuments next door, right? So I started this project when I was in Mississippi. I was in Jackson four years, five years ago and there are roads in Jackson that haven't been paved, but that Confederate statue downtown is pristine, right? So that, I mean, when it, so they could redirect those, if they wanna to continue to uh, preserving those monuments, redirect those resources outside of the public space. I agree with you completely. And, and the way that we have been advocating for preservation is equity is over the last, four years, we collaborated with Congresswoman Terry Sewell of Alabama and Congressman James Clyburn of South Carolina, resurrected the HPCU Preservation Fund, created the new Civil Rights Grant Program, and in total are directing almost $100 million in the preservation of these spaces and to begin to diversify our national inventory of historic places. And I feel like that is just the beginning because the scale of public investment to erect, maintain this, this form of white terrorism, literally in public spaces, that if we can quantify the economic impact of this to make even stronger arguments for federal investment to ensure that the preservation of black history happens, I think that would be power. I, and I totally agree with uh, with you. We've I assigned this article about the cost of the Confederacy that was in the Smithsonian Magazine, and I've dropped it into the chat because there are real dollars that are be funded through state budgets to maintain these sites. Mm -hmm. So why not just right now redirect that money? Like it seems to me there's a lot of resources for literally decades that have gone into the preservation of these memorials. Um, and we need to, 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 stop, to stop this and to really rethink um, um, how we are not only funding hate, right, through the support of Confederate monuments, like this is profound, like that your state dollars, whether you realize it or not, are going to Confederate monuments. 
um, but also what, what kind of other stories that we want to tell. And I think certainly as you've pointed out, Brent and Ada, it's a story about kind of the preservation of African-American history, but there's other histories to be told in the United States too. And I uh, also have been thinking a lot of, a lot about the, the Battle of the Little Bighorn uh, for, and the monuments there, but also what does it mean to talk about indigenous histories in relationship to this and how are we going to preserve indigenous histories? And let's say even the histories of the Japanese internment, how are we going to really, we're starting that process, but how do we document and do this kind of work? Thank you. Um, in regards to the preservation as equity, as um, many of our ethical standards of our professions, it, it seems contradictory removal of statutes. So how does one navigate their profession um, of removal? Um, and even in some cases, preservation of the artist's intervention or uh, vandalism. And how do you navigate profession with, with uh, equity, preservation uh, is removal. Yeah, so the, the culture at the National Trust for Historic Preservation has shifted over the last couple of years. I, I, I believe deeply that the Action Fund is really shifting preservation practice in the profession and that equity and activism is the, the heartbeat of preservation today and into the future. So in, in 2017, our Confederate monument statement was, we should not erase history, but at the same time, we don't have to revere this history. This year, our Confederate monument statement said that we support the relocation and removal of Confederate statues with the right contextualization and interpretation if they are to be removed in another, in, in place in another public space. I think that is progressive in many ways for a tr traditional preservation organization like the National Trust. It is our form of equity because in essence, we are advocating that there are overlooked histories that too deserve to be in these prominent public spaces. And so we're trying to create space. And I think the, the most important thing is creating space for African Americans to have a seat at the table to make these kinds of public policy decisions. And that our nation needs to understand that black people have a claim to this history as much as the descendants of the lost cause. And what I mean by that is our Southern history is black history. And this is a Southern history. So I'm empathetic to the unlearning that has to happen for the descendants, but I am also wanting to ensure that black voices and black people, that we claim our full power and that we define the future of Confederate monuments. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we really power to the people. That was so great, Brent. <laughs> I mean, but also I think Renee, what you mentioned too is important, right? Because the, the history of the United States isn't just black and white, right? It, there's there's so many other there, you know, like colonialism happened. There is genocide, right? Genocide of indigenous peoples across this land. How do we reconcile with that? Where where are the where is the where is that in the K through twelve pedagogy? But then also where is that in the um, in the public landscape, right? Like I guess we could think about that um, in terms of reservations. But the, even that, I mean, but that in itself is an indication, right, of the inequities that we, that are still present, right? But I mean, I I think. Also, I really want to reiterate the fact like Robert E. Lee, all of, you know, uh, ja Jefferson Davis, they weren't even interested in, in, in maintaining this Confederate uh, flag. Like they weren't even trying to hold that up anymore when they were, when they were alive. So why, you know, it, it's, 
But I also think it's interesting to think about the Confederate flag as it relates to the United States flag, because some people feel the same way about both of them as it relates to the genocide of, of, of indigenous people, right? I mean, I just want to complicate, I just want to complicate everything because that's just what I like to do sometimes. But yeah, I don't know if there's, yeah, I'm going to stop here. And I can, if I could, and I'm not a preservation person, what's interesting to me, for example, so the Valentine House in Richmond um, and Valentine made the Jefferson Davis, they're taking it with all the graffiti and they want it with the graffiti. They don't want to clean it. So someone asked about this, like, are we going to take all the paint off? I think I saw that in one of the questions and they see it as a valid intervention that they want to preserve and to have in the house when you come, because it will add a dimension to the story of this artist who created that object. So that's what they're seeking um, at the Valentine House, in particular around, um, you know, these painted bases. And I think this idea of the plinth um, is done. Like, right? I mean, I think that's one thing we've learned that the plinth, the that base of the statue, but that it can be all sorts. It can have projections on it. It can have performance on it, right? That you can do other objects on it. Like, it be, can become the springboard, quite frankly, to do all sorts of other kinds of storytelling, uh, which is pretty exciting. Thank you for all of that. I love the acknowledgement of like making it complicated, like intersectionality is a thing. Mm -hmm. um, and our next question sort of speaks to community engagement because uh, while we are, you know, largely an audience of conservators, we, with these monuments, I think a lot of us hope to take more of a um, community forward approach to the conservation of them if we ever are tasked with such a thing. And so the question, like, can you just speak to your experience with community engagement and contested monuments? Yeah, I, I'll start off. And, and just to say that two examples. So, so I had the good fortune to lead the creation of the Birmingham Civil Rights National Monument. And at the centerpiece is the A.G. Gaston Motel, constructed in 1954, Green Book site, uh, built by A.G. Gaston, most successful Black entrepreneur during the period of segregation, first Black-owned motel in the entire state. In the spring of 1963, the entire American civil rights movement would descend. The Birmingham campaign known as Project C, math, youth demonstration movement that was a catalyst for the 1964 Civil Rights Act. When we got involved, this building had been vacant for 20 years and a very senior member on the federal side looked at this motel when we were advocating with the community that it should be represented within our national parks. And they said, all we see is deferred maintenance. So it was not about the history. It wasn't about the, the advocacy of the grassroots community or even an African-American mayor at that time. So the way that we were able to achieve success was able to get the city to direct its full resources. I wrote and we developed a shared use plan for moving this project forward in, in warp speed time in a year and a half. But the real power came from the African American property owners like the Board of Trustees and Reverend Pastor Price at 16th Street Baptist Church representatives from Bethel, the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute. It was bringing together the black cultural institutions, having a shared vision, talking points. And then we had public community engagement events, one called the, the March for Birmingham. We had the artist Lettucey perform free concert and it brought the community together to remind them of the significance of, of, of American history that they steward literally across this collection of historic sites across three or four blocks. So I would say that the most important thing is to identify the black cultural institutions, bring them together, understand what their vision is for their community. And then we provide our specialized expertise in helping them to move that forward. And what I've often seen is sometimes the, the vision is not as ambitious as it should be. 
given the significance of our story and the places we preserve. So I say, how many more national parks can we create to tell the story of the Black experience? How many more sites in Richmond, like Shaco Bottom, that's sitting there, literally invisible, but that collective memory is still alive within the Black community and they are advocating. So in that es example, we used community engagement with artists and graphic designers and architects that would take their vision, put it into a visual framework, which you saw on that slide. And then we went through a process of helping them to strengthen their arguments. So now they say that this project links together preservation, economic development and memorialization. And so part of that economic development argument was funding an equitable development plan so that they could quantify the economic impact of, of restoring and reviving this cultural landscape. Yeah, I'm an artist, so I've, I'm always constantly trying to have a conversation with an audience. <laughs> so to date, um, I've been hosting these workshops um, since 2018, and to date I have about 500 different responses and it's not like the, the concept is really about like, what is a monument, right? Or what, is, what will a monument in the future look like? Um, when was the last time you even looked at a monument, right? So it's a series of questions that I have been asking various groups of people. Um, I, I did it in Dallas, I did it in Baltimore, and I did it in DC. And um, overall, like the general responses have been that people are interested in, in seeing more engaging monuments or more monuments where there's space for interaction with the stories of the past. Um, and I, I think one, I mean, one could argue that, you know, like Renee's project with the Instagram, right? Like the, the archive, right? Because the, a monument is essentially an archive, right? Like we have the ability to create our archives every day on social media, right? So I think that a lot of, um, yeah, most of the people that I've, I've had conversations with are like, how do we use technology to connect us more and use technology to create more robust stories? Um, you know, when, I mean, the 1619 project, mm -hmm. that interactive website is a, is a wonderful archive. Um, and also a monument, right? Uh, uh, so I think um, long story short is yes, I think it's important to have community dialogue around the stories of these objects that are supposed to be signifiers of the past, but also it's important to reimagine and dream around, about what new formats could look like. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, the project, the Contemporary Monuments to Slave Past, I'm moving very directly into community involvement because I want partly to see what is it that people value and think is a monument? What kind of photographs are they going to send us? What kind of things are they going to identify? But also in some ways to get people very much connected to the their own memorial landscapes and monumental landscapes and to think about space in new ways. So. Uh, as far as the project that kind of gets at a little bit at this really complicated question about community in engagement. Um, and Ada, you know, really the Instagram memorial started as a personal grieving uh, project and trying to sort through grief at watching a man being killed, a black man being killed on television, right? Mm -hmm. And trying to process that in some way. And being really frustrated with Instagram, but also thinking like, can I'm, I'm, I'm always interested in technology. Can I use this digital realm to, to actually literally do an intervention and tell a different kind of story? And in some ways I was working against all the happy loaves of sourdough bread that seemed to have cropped up uh, during COVID like in a really strange way, right? Um, but also that memorial has very much to do with my advisor die, dying at, of COVID during this time period um, of witnessing the death of, uh, George Floyd. So I do, and then actually having the very first people respond were my graduate students said, oh, wow, you've given us a space to mourn. And I was like, oh, I, I just put this up as a marker to uh, the other 
blog I wrote about that. And then I started to post them every day and have now done for 130 days. And um, I have a group of 400 people who follow every day. So it's clearly doing some kind of work for someone. I don't know exactly what that work is because I haven't interviewed people yet, but, um, and that's okay with me that people also need space with monuments to sort out what they think about it and how they want how they want to interact and, and, and what they think the potential of, uh, let's say, the digital or Instagram as an activist platform, let's say, uh, to tell different kinds of stories. Um, so that is how that the digital memorial on Instagram. But I, I've been really impressed actually with with this group of contemporary artists like you, Ada, Becky Davis is one and who's working in um, Rhode Island to get communities to enter spaces that traditionally they were excluded from. So in, in uh, Rhode Island, Becky Davis has this did this project with the Burnside Monument, you know, an equestrian monument, a very traditional, but she actually set up that you could come and get your hair braided there and get your hair, that black woman could show up in that space. And, and it was astounding. Like she showed his video, I could not believe, like you kind of forgot George Burnside on that horse. And the space lived in a new way and had a different kind of function and could tell different stories about the black community that surrounded the monument. So there's all sorts of ways that artists can, I think, transform even the monuments that stay and, and invite people into those spaces who have always felt that they don't belong in those spaces. One thing I, I just want to build on that. So uh, a lot of my thinking as of late is related to the ephemeral and, and how do we memorialize the artwork related to the killing of George Floyd or the murals related to Black Lives Matter movement or Breonna Taylor that we see in, in Louisville, Kentucky? And, and is that the role of contemporary preservationists to advocate for the preservation of our recent past, not just you know, the buildings and artifacts that are 50 years or older? And I say we should. And the exciting news is the University of St. Thomas in Minneapolis is documenting every George Floyd um, mural, ephemeral kind of art, protest art. They have both a protest art database and one to George Floyd, and they've already collected something like 1,500 objects. And so they're wow. using Omega as their database. And I know uh, Heather Sherry runs that project. So there's someone who's actually doing that preservation work right now, like trying to capture the ephemeral so that we know that there was a response. So it doesn't mm -hmm. disappear, that we can document it in history that people were angry and they had, they wanted to show their grief in public space in these ways. So um, I'll put a link uh, into that uh, so that people can see it into the chat. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. So how does a conservator or anyone in the public uh, support artists and cultural bearers to create these spaces, to reclaim these spaces? What are the avenues through, through social activism or through uh, contacting government? How do we, how do we support? I would say that you can provide support to the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund. Mm -hmm. It is a movement that has never happened before. In many ways, it's it's something that was unimaginable five to 10 years ago. And so joining this movement and helping us be successful because it creates the blueprint for the other social and ethnic communities that will follow in the footsteps. And it's my goal and hope that eventually we'll be investing billions of dollars to tell the full diverse story of American history. I would say at a local level, you know, whether it's students or conservators getting together and having a conversation, building out some guiding principles, putting together a, an agenda that you map out almost a basic strategic plan that has equity driven outcomes and that you begin to move forward in, in, in advancing that work as activism. And that's something that anyone can do on a Zoom meeting or, or phone call, and, and it can be informal, but it can have potential big impacts. Um, are, are you all okay with going a little bit over time since we started late? Unfortunately, I have to, I have to leave. I have a, another meeting.
And unfortunately, I do too. Sorry, it got back to, it's back to back today. <laughs> yeah. Um, are you okay for one more question or? Okay. Nyla, would you like to do a final question or? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, let's see. Well, I know we've touched on this a little bit, but I think it would be a great note to end on. So what is the future of monuments and public space? The what? next hour, please tell us. <laughs> well, I spent the entire semester talking about that. <laughs> great, that's, that's a solid four <laughs> years. <laughs> <laughs> four or five years. I mean, I think, you know, honestly, I'm hopeful for the future. The future is us continuing to do the work that we have been doing. And I think the future is, um, it, it, it's looking promising because, you know, again, this is a global conversation that I think, I, I think that we need to acknowledge. Um, so yeah, I think the future of monuments uh, is a, a lot more nuanced than they have been in the past. I mean, we're in the 21st century, so um, there's a lot of there's a lot of potential to move past this this person on a horse on a plank situation, mm -hmm. and I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> I would say that the future is about truth, mm -hmm. and if we can create an equitable and truthful American landscape that uplifts the stories of diverse communities mm -hmm. and that we begin to elevate both the cultural and financial value of these assets. And that a place that like uh, the Nina Simone home, a piece of simple vernacular architecture, that in essence is a monument. And so hopefully we can shift public perceptions to be able to value these kinds of histories and spaces. And I so appreciate you saying that because I do think we need more expansive notions of what we consider monuments. And I guess I'm gonna underscore both what Ada and Brent said, but I think um, really as we move forward is this idea of polyvocality, that, that we are a group that has a, a society that has many kinds of voices uh, that need to be heard and need to be part of the conversation and that we think really hard about what that means. And also, you know, I want to just point out as the art, as a, you know, the art historian that, you know, monuments are not permanent. And this is something I am intrigued that we insist that they are permanent. And I think, you know, historically, if we go all the way back to the Egyptians times, let's say uh, way back, we have removed monuments, we have destroyed monuments, we have vandalized monuments. We've been doing this as a long time as human beings. This is not unusual behavior. And part for me is that people actually get educated on the history of that to understand that our engagement with monuments is very long. Human beings have been putting up monuments and memorials, it feels like, since we could figure out how to do it, right? Um, and that uh, most importantly, that we get the, this, at least in the current moment, I would actually like to see more engagement with communities around what they want. This is really important to me that we move towards, um, I guess, inclusiveness in this decision making about what gets preserved and who gets to preserve it and how and the stories that get preserved, but that communities are pretty smart um, about this. And I think if we can engage them in the ways that Brent was pointing towards some funding uh, for that, um, we can have really vibrant conversations in the future about monuments and, and monumental space. Do you all want one more question? <laughs> oh, I, unfortunately, I have to. I have to. <laughs> I gotta go. <laughs> but we can come back again. Yeah, we can come back again if you would like. Yeah. Yeah. That would be great. Uh, thank you all so much. Nyla and I have a, a, a last slide to share with the um, participants if you all have to go. But um, thank you so much for taking the time to be here and sharing your wonderful work. Oh, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Oh, thank you. My screen. So, hopefully, people can see this. Okay. Yeah. So we we didn't want to just end this conversation with. Um, um, with just moving on to the next the next uh, 
presentation. We wanted to give some, maybe some thought points to take back to your forums or take back to your institutions or your labs um, and talk about what we can do as conservators um, to actually fulfill this work of inclusion and representation in monuments and how we move forward through our, our work as conservators in general. So um, we, Nyla and I came up with these action items. The first was for us as conservators to create guidelines for community engagement, um, how to identify stakeholders and whether it's an area where you need or have a contested monument or would like to create something more inclusive, um, how to create and sustain relationships and transparency with community and compensation and proper acknowledgement of community collaborators. The second one is historical grounding in communities where you work and study, identifying racial injustice and discrimination in your surrounding communities, identifying racist policies, both the history and current that affect your communities, and identify community organizations that are already working within the social justice context for police advocacy and restorative practices. And piggybacking off of that is really just challenging your own biases. You know, a lot of this work comes from you and how you would approach a situation, especially when working with sort of, uh, if you are sort of part of the dominant narrative and the dominant culture and you want to try to um, reach out to historically marginalized groups and communities, it's really important that you sort of look at yourself and try and, you know, as, disassemble some of those biases that have just been built into us via the system of white supremacy that we live in. Yes. And possibly a racial equity statement by AIC and updating um, the AIC code of ethics to reflect diversity, equity, inclusion, and access goals for our practices. Yeah, I saw a couple of people asking sort of about like, is it ethical? Like how do we sort of stay in line with our ethics and interact with these monuments? And I think um, that really is something that should be updated and included in the sort of AIC code of ethics. So we have a very clear answer to that question. Yes. So thank you again, everyone. Um, I guess Sarah will we'll take it from here. Yeah, thank you so much um, to both of you and to all of the speakers and to everyone that joined us here today. Um, I just wanted to let you know that there are two more free webinars in the social justice and conservation series. The next webinar will be on decolonizing collections and prioritizing community partnerships. We're working to schedule that webinar for December and we'll share the dates once we have them. The other webinar will be on emotion and bias in conservation work, which most likely will be in February. And then we'll also be doing a workshop on creating 21st century conservation ethics framework, which will take place in the spring. And that will be an interactive session that will allow participants to work in small groups with a facilitator to discuss the topics from these webinars and to work to reimagine what a more equitable conservation field could look like. We hope that you can join us for these programs and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. You can keep an eye out for an email from us um, with the link to the recording of this program. And we would ask that you share that link with anyone who wasn't able to make it here today. Thank you.